Okay, um, so today we're gonna review stand dynamics and we're gonna look at stand dynamics through a, a little bit of a new lens, uh, sort of exploring how it interacts with silviculture and how we're gonna use what you've learned in ecology and field silviculture to apply to prescription writing and understanding how we can manipulate forest stands. And so, we're talking primarily about ecology today for context. We're not going to get too much into the economic or societal aspects of silviculture. And so you all have uh, learned in ecology, field silviculture, other courses, the four stages Oliver and Larson came up with for stand development. It's not the only model of stand development, but it's a good, pretty simple model uh, that does a good job describing most of our stands pretty well here in the southern United States. Um, so let's think a, a little bit <clears throat> about the four stages here. So the first one is stand initiation. So what are some of the structures and processes that you would anticipate seeing in that stand initiation phase? What was that, Alana? Planting. So planting. Yeah, you can plant trees. What other structures and processes might we see during stand initiation? Okay, so in terms of treatments, we could burn, we could apply herbicide. Um, let, let's think just beyond silvicultural treatments too. So if you have a stand that may not have been managed much, it could still be in the stand initiation phase. And so what, what are the forest structures we would expect to see out there in the ongoing, just naturally occurring ecological processes? Okay, so you're gonna have a pretty high density. And then what, what are the size of the trees gonna be? Yeah, they're gonna be little. <clears throat> so you have a high density of very small trees. Okay, what else do you expect out in the stand during stand initiation? Is the only thing that's out there small trees? Yes, yeah, so there may be grass and other species, herbaceous species, vines, others. What else might be out there? What was that? Yeah, the composition may not be all desirable for sure. So we had a hurricane last week, right? It did a lot of damage in Louisiana. I'm sure there's plenty of damage to some forest stands they have over there. Could that hurricane have reset some of them to stand initiation? Absolutely, yeah, we had what, 150 mile an hour winds? Um, so those stands that are in stand initiation right now, what would you expect to see when you went out there this week? Yeah, it's going to be a mess. You're going to have a lot of stuff left over from the previous stand. So you're going to have live biological legacies where there's some standing trees that survived. You're going to have a lot of dead, large woody material from whatever that previous rotation was. So you end up with remnants of the previous rotation. Okay, in terms of processes, are these trees, the small seedlings, are they competing with one another? Not yet, right? They're small enough that even though they're in a high density, they're not really competing too intensely with one another yet during stand initiation. Okay, so as we look at the break point between stand initiation and stem exclusion, what's that dividing line? What structure or process occurs that differentiates between stand initiation and stem exclusion? Mortality, mortality and more specifically, what type of mortality? density dependent mortality. So the trees are start competing with one another and they start killing each other off. So that's the process that's the barrier between stand initiation and stem exclusion, our delineating line. So if the process is density dependent mortality, what structures are you gonna see that are gonna cause that? What happens structurally in the forest? Yeah, so we start seeing canopy differentiation a little bit. Absolutely, the winners start winning, the losers start losing. But what's the very first thing? So, so if you've got two little seedlings, what needs to happen for them to actually compete with one another? So it has to start growing taller, but if they're far enough apart, that doesn't matter, right? So what do they have to do to actually compete with one another? Yeah, canopy closure. And so canopy closure is a great structural indicator that you've started moving into stem exclusion and you've started moving into that phase in a rotation 
where you expect uh, density dependent mortality to start occurring. And then that causes a lot of other processes uh, along the way. Canopy differentiation goes along with self pruning. So your trees start shedding lower limbs since the canopies have closed. This is the point in the rotation when nutrients start becoming limiting. In stem exclusion, you have a lot of nutrients out there from the decomposing material from the previous rotation often. And the trees are real small, they don't have a high nutrient demand, but by the time you get to canopy closure, the trees are bigger, larger crowns, a lot of that material has decomposed, um, especially here in the southern US. And so you start getting nutrient deficiencies developing. And uh, as you move through that, you eventually get to understory reinitiation, our third phase. And so what, what could be a dividing line between stem exclusion and understory reinitiation? Yeah, so gap formation is a great example. And what, what's causing those gaps to form? Yeah, so the trees are falling down. Why are they falling down? So they died, but did they die from competition with one another? So wind, does wind have, does uh, stand density have much influence on wind damage? <clears throat> right, so you start moving into density independent mortality, where now the causes of mortality aren't so directly linked to competition with other trees in that stand, rather they're a variety of different factors, which may have little to do with the density that the stand is at. So in this case, it could be lightning striking a single tree, wind throw that may not have a whole lot to do with the density, insect outbreaks, disease outbreaks, all sorts of other disturbances that are leading to gap formation and then subsequently gap expansion. <clears throat> so when a gap forms, what happens in that gap? New growth. So that's where we get the name, right? Understory reinitiation. And so you start getting new vegetation coming up in the understory, both seedlings and herbaceous vegetation, vines, other taxa, uh, because there's now light there because you have this gap formation, this gap expansion. And so you start also getting much larger trees. So those larger trees are gonna be more complex structurally themselves. You start getting larger limbs, you start building up more diverse epiphytic communities. Um, and so you end up with structural complexity in the crown. As these trees start dying due to density independent mortality and falling down and forming these gaps, you get large down woody debris. Uh, some of them may die and remain standing for a period, so you end up with snags. So you end up with more and more structural complexity. Now, when you look at the gap between understory reinitiation and old growth, you know, you could get five different experts in a room and come up with 20 different answers. So that's not quite as firm a line between those. And if you think about it, it's kind of uh, driven by how Oliver and Larson define these stages. Stand initiation is a process. Stem exclusion is a process. Understory reinitiation is a process. Old growth is this structural category of a whole bunch of processes lumped together. So it doesn't really kind of follow the mold of the other three categories. But basically everything we saw developing in understory reinitiation, you get more of it in old growth. So you get more gaps, you get bigger gaps, you get expanding gaps, you get even more complex crowns, even larger crowns. You end up with even more diversity. You end up with more cohorts as the seedlings that established in the understory during understory initiation. Some of them make them um, up into the mid story and higher canopy strata. So you have that uneven age diameter distribution uh, driving these stands. One thing you could try to put in there as a line between them would be pioneer cohort loss, where you lose all the original trees that were out there. But that's kind of hit or miss. Um, so for those of you that had field station face to face, we walked through the Mill Creek Cove old growth stand. For those who had it online this past summer, uh, there was about a 20 minute video or so going through that Mill Creek Cove old growth stand. And there were some really big pines in there. Those were probably the pioneer cohorts. Some of them are still in there. Um, they could be 150, 200 years old. Uh, but structurally, that meets most of the characteristics you would associate uh, with old growth. So there's a little bit of a review on uh, stand development. And so we're gonna talk also this semester a lot about diameter distributions, okay? Um, because with these diameter distributions, they end up telling us a lot about the forest stand, okay? So if we look at that diameter distribution on the top left for even age stands, how would you describe that, dis that distribution just to the right of that picture of the even age stand? 
It's a bell curve, exactly. Uh, so a bell curve, a normal curve, a Gaussian distribution, all different ways of describing that, you know, one hump curve there, right? What causes that? And so if, if you think back to basic probability and statistics, anything you learned about a normal distribution, the answer is going to be the same here, right? So what's the fundamental cause of that bell-shaped curve? This could be in any population. If we gave a pop quiz right now, your grades would probably follow something like that. I mean, it could be if we measured the height of everyone in this room, it would probably follow something like that. So what, what's the fundamental cause of that? What do you need in a population to get a curve like that? What was that? So you need a peak point, which we call the mean, right? Okay, so there's some number in there that's most common with whatever you're measuring. Okay, so that's one parameter we need. What's the other parameter? So why, why isn't every individual in this stand right at the peak point? Why aren't all the trees average? This stand isn't in Lake Wobegon. Yeah, you've got variability. So you have variability in a population. So if you have variability in a population and a large enough sample size, in most cases, you're gonna approximate this normal distribution. So let's think about what's causing the variability and how these trees grow. And there's two key factors driving those, that variability. What are they gonna be? So genetics, we have different genetics within the stand. So that's one factor causing variability. And what's the other major factor? Sort of a broad category. So competition kind of plays into it. Here it's an even age stand, so they're all about the same age. So it's not gonna be age. Resource yeah, resource av availability. So we can broadly think of that as the environment, right? Um, and so in a stand, the climate's gonna be pretty much similar throughout the stand, unless you have like really steep topography or something, but you're gonna have microsite variation. And so because of that microsite variation, some trees may have an advantage over other trees. So it's genetics, the environment, and that inter interaction of genetics and the environment. So with even age stands, you're gonna have a few little trees, a few big trees, a lot of average trees. And we're going to see this a lot when we start talking about treatments like thinning, where we may be um, going through a stand trying to merchandise things and, you know, trying to improve that diameter distribution. So we'll talk about that at length later this semester. Um, now let's look uh, at the stand in the middle on the right. So we have our balanced uneven age stand, right? Or sorry, I guess it's bottom left here. Our balanced uneven age stand. So we call that a reverse J shaped curve because it kind of looks like a J backwards. So that's our reverse J-shaped curve. And so how many big trees do you have relative to little trees in that stand? Not that many. You have a, few, a very small number of big trees and a lot of little trees in that balanced all age stand. Well, how much space does a big tree take up? A lot, right? And then the little trees, they take up very little space. And so in terms of your space occupancy in that stand, the big trees are gonna be dominating that stand but there's gonna be trees of all size classes represented. So you're gonna have little areas within that stand that are probably in a very high density of very small trees. And then you end up with other areas that have a low density of stems, but they're really large trees. And it's all just messy within that stand. And so this is sort of our silvicultural goal if we are managing an uneven aged forest. Um, so if you're managing an uneven aged forest and you have that diameter distribution, the hope is that you can cut a few big trees and then the trees in the size class just smaller than that will grow up into it before you come back in and are able to cut them. So you're able to cut at the far right of that curve and everything just sort of keeps moving to the right. And you're doing it in different little spots on the stand at each entry as you repeat the entry. Okay, but again, this is the real world. So say you had been, you know, just east of the Sabine River, managing a forest for a long time and you'd gotten it pretty close to this. Well, you know, Hurricane Laura comes through last week and it kills trees in some cohorts more than other trees. So a hurricane, for example, you would expect to damage the really large trees, but some of the medium sized trees and smaller trees may not be as damaged, right? Uh, smaller trees can be bent all the way to the ground, pop right back up and be okay by width. And so what you end up with then is a distribution like the one you see on the top right there, which is the irregular uneven age diameter distribution where what you see is there's some areas where you have more trees in a cohort represented than you would expect in that balanced uneven age stand. 
but you have other cohorts where you're basically missing all the truths, okay? You've had severe or possibly complete mortality in some cohorts. So with that irregular uneven age stand, that's what we tend to find in the real world. But if you're trying to manage that with that uneven age silvicultural system, a selection silvicultural system, you get to a point where there's a period of years where you get into that gap where there's no trees in that cohort where you can't harvest for a while. You may have issues where you have an overabundance of trees in some cohorts, you don't want to over harvest them and reduce your stocking so you're not using the full carrying capacity of that site. And so what you do is you take that irregular uneven age stand and you work over a period of entries. It may take a rotation and you try to move it back towards that balanced uneven age stand, that reverse J-shaped curve. But of course, something again is gonna happen. You're gonna have some unexpected disturbance and you're back to the irregular distribution. So that irregular distribution is the real world. The balanced uneven age option is really our silvicultural goal. That's what we're trying to achieve. Now, if you look at a large enough scale, if we took all the forests in East Texas and did a diameter distribution on all 12.1 million acres, it might look like that balanced uneven aged curve just because we have such a large acreage uh, with you know, some stands that are really mature like our national forests and grasslands and some stands that aren't very mature. So like all our newly established plantations. Okay, uh, we're not gonna worry too much about that stratified mixture there, but I wanna draw your attention to the, the picture on the bottom right. We were in a stand like this last Tuesday. Um, so that is our two age stand where you had those big older pines and then we had the younger cohort of pines beneath them. And you can see if you just sampled that younger cohort of pines, you end up with a normal distribution. It looks like an even age stand, but here in that diagram, they've just drawn two little lines for those two big trees. So what you end up with is a bimodal distribution where you have a, a normal shaped curve for the younger cohort, probably a normal shaped curve for the older cohort. And so you have a bimodal distribution there. So any, any questions on diameter distributions? It's pretty powerful when you think about it, because if you just go out and you measure the diameters of the trees and it comes back as that normal shaped curve, there's a very good bet all those trees are about the same age, okay? And so that's a, a pretty powerful tool. Okay, uh, so we've got, I think about 22 people in here. Uh, so what I wanna do is have you all split up into five groups, and this is what we're gonna spend most of the day doing. So let me explain the exercise to you, then you can split up into groups. And then once you've split up into groups, um, you guys can meet and come up with your numbers. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna prepare a little table with these numbers in it, and you're gonna bring it up here when you're done. One person in your group will bring it up. I'm gonna type it into an actual spreadsheet. And then what we'll do once everyone's done is we'll look at the graphs we create uh, from all your data that you provide. So this is a thought exercise. So this isn't a real stand, but the scenario is you're in a plantation, it's commercially clear cut, and then you plant a certain density of trees. This, is, this can be lava all the time, just to keep it simple. And then you walk away and you don't manage that stand any further. And all you do is come back every 10 years and you remeasure the stand, okay? We're assuming that in that 40 year period, the stand is not hit by a stand replacing disturbance, okay? So there's no hurricane or something that goes through that blows the whole stand down. But you're not managing it, you're just coming out and seeing what happens. Um, and so what I want you to do at each age, age 0, 10, 20, 30, and 40, I want you to give me four different numbers. How many trees per acre are there? What's the basal area per acre? What's the QMD, the quadratic mean diameter, so that's the average diameter. And what's the volume in tons per acre? Now I'll give you an equation for QMD because QMD is calculated from density and basal area. And so you can't just say a density, say a basal area, then make up a QMD, that, that won't actually work, right? Um, so you need to link it in that way. But basically what you're doing is you're just coming up with your best guesstimate for each of these variables at each of these ages. There's no formula, there's no trick, anything like that. You're just trying to take your understanding of stand dynamics and sort of express it in a, in a quantitative way. And so do your best on these. Uh, you don't need to use the, use the useful handouts packet or the internet or anything like that. Just come up with the best numbers that you can based on what you've learned in biometrics, field civil culture, uh, and your other courses. So is, are there any questions on the exercise here? Okay, um, go ahead and split up into four, sorry, five groups. And then let's get one person from each group to raise your hand. 
Um, and again, we've got the whole outside area here we can use as well if y'all want to spread out to, to work on this. Okay, um, so you all have provided uh, your numbers. And so we had one group for each of the five densities. And so we've got them plugged into this spreadsheet here. So as we start looking at the data here, and, and again, this was a hypothetical exercise, and this was sort of an introduction to you all for a lot of these numbers. So you may not have had a, a good idea yet of what these numbers should look like. Um, but you can see up here, this first one, that's gonna be our trees per acre. And so you can see you guys are all predicting density dependent mortality. And you can see that in general, the stands that started at a lower density seem to drop a little less maybe. So you guys are all predicting kind of the same thing there, just different magnitudes. Let me see if I can go over here. And here we've got basal area. So it's kind of hard to see here what's going on because one group's up at about 2,000 square feet per acre. Um, two groups. If you can grow that, let me know. We need to go into business. Um, <laughs> you might see like an, a fantastic pine plantation in the south up around 250 square feet per acre in some areas of the stand. Um, 200 might be a more realistic cap. And the 200 number, that's a more modern number. Like even 20 years ago, you probably wouldn't be expecting it that high without better genetics, uh, fertilizer, herbicides, all, all the pieces we put together. But you might even start thinning a stand, thinking about thinning a stand around a basal area of 135 or 150 square feet per acre possibly. Um, so it looks like three of the groups came up with relatively reasonable basal area estimates. Uh, and two were a little over the top. Um, then let's go down here and check out QMB, I think. Yeah, so here's QMB. Um, and so you guys all have QMB increasing, that's good. Uh, trees don't shrink. Uh, but there's some disagreement on size. We've got a couple of the groups and uh, let me see what densities are those. So it looks like 200 trees per acre gets up to 14 inches, but then we have some of the higher densities getting up even larger. Which would you expect? Which, which density, planting density should have the highest quadratic mean diameter at the end of the rotation? The lower densities, the lower densities right? It's what we'd expect, but you guys were working independently. So uh, we, we came up with different numbers there. Okay, and then here's our volumes. And again, we see the same thing. We're, we're up at tons per acre, uh, 200 there for the high one. Um, and then we're at about 100 for some of the others. And then a few of them are down in the, looks like 10 to 20 range. So uh, during the first class, I did mention something that was intended to help you with this. Remember, we talked about a log truck in East Texas and how they tend to carry 28 and a half tons, roughly. So you could even round that up to 30 just to give you sort of an easy ballpark to keep in your head. And so a typical rotation, we might be harvesting between four and six truckloads per acre. So six truckloads would be 180 tons, um, four truckloads would be 120 tons, about, that's a slight overestimate, but your average might be about 150 tons per acre over rotation. But that's in a pine plantation where you're removing some of that tonnage and thinning, and then you're getting more at the end in a clear cut. And that's probably on closer to a 25 year rotation. Here you're on a 40 year rotation, okay? And so again, the point was, you know, you guys are starting to develop a benchmark in your head for some of these numbers. Uh, so this exercise was intended to sort of make you think about it so you can see what you know pretty well, what you're having more trouble with, so you can focus there. Um, so when we're out doing stand descriptions, and you're looking at the composition of the stand, the litter layer, all these other things, you also wanna start keeping an eye for what's basal area and start getting a, a tally on that. Those who had field station this past summer, we showed you how to calculate basal area of your thumb, so you can use that as an angle gauge real quick and easy. I can send that to anybody who wasn't in field station this past year, so you can start getting quick, easy estimates of basal area. So, so those were the data that you all came up with in this exercise. And so what I wanna show you next, uh, we're gonna use PTAIDA modeling software, um, hopefully during the lab later this semester. And so I went ahead and I used PTAIDA to model these scenarios out so we could look at some reasonable model data uh, that would show what we might expect. And so here are the assumptions I put into the model. Of course, a model, you change the assumptions, you change the output, right? Uh, but what I did is kind of came up with an average site here in East Texas, sort of average product specs, and then you can see my planting densities are a little bit different uh, than what yours are. 
because PT is specified by spacing. Uh, you don't just type in a density, you type in the trees are on a 10 by 10 foot spacing and it calculates the density from that. So you can see they're, they're close, but they're not exact. And so here's what PTAEDA came up with. So you've got the, vault, the, the stem exclusion occurring. You've got densities dropping throughout the rotation, just like you all predicted. Um, you can see the magnitudes here low. They're predicting you going from 1,000 to only 400 trees per acre in 40 years on that stand planted at 1,000 trees per acre. And then look at 200 trees per acre. It goes down to about 150 or so, so not a whole lot of mortality there. So you guys kind of got pretty close to that. Um, if you look at the quadratic mean diameters, you can see we, we may have had some overestimation there by a little bit on some of those groups. Um, but what it's showing here is that even in the 200 trees per acre scenario, over 40 years, the average tree size is only getting up to 14 inches. Um, and so again, with this, I modeled an average site. But we know with no silviculture and no thinning, we're not going to be able to get those diameters as large as we would in a stand with more intensive management with thinning. And so that may not be too unrealistic for the scenario. And so you guys were tending to overestimate diameters by a little bit. And let's see here. Here's basal areas. So you can see they're asymptoting off at about 150 to 180 there. And what, what is that asymptote at the top with basal area? You see the same thing on the right with volume. What's that asymptote there indicate? What is it ecologically? So all of a sudden you can't get more basal area, you can't get more volume out there, you've maxed it out. So what have you done? You've hit the carrying capacity of the site, right? That's showing you the carrying capacity of the site because basal area you can see is closely correlated to volume. Um, it's just probably a little easier to estimate than volume. And then why is the carrying capacity fundamentally lower on 200 trees per acre there? So what's that stand with 200 trees per acre look like? Realistically, in East Texas, if you planted 200 pints per acre and walked away and came back 40 years later, it, it would be a mixed stand, right? Um, and so this, however, is only showing you the pine data. Okay, this is not showing you much in the way of hardwoods here. PTA does model a minor hardwood component, but not what you would probably really see on the ground with 200 trees per acre. They're not really fully utilizing the site. So you, you've lowered carrying capacity on that site just because you're wasting soil resources, light, you're not fully occupying the site because you have too few trees per acre. And then check out volumes on the right. And what you notice is kind of interesting. All these densities come to kind of a similar volume, right? Would you have predicted that, that, you know, a thousand trees per acre, 200 trees per acre ends up at almost all those ages with about the same volume? So that's kind of counterintuitive, right? So here's how that plays out though. I broke it down in a product class here for you. So on the left, you have saw timber and on the right, you have pulpwood there. And so look at a thousand trees per acre. You have almost no saw timber and you have quite a bit of pulpwood. Compare that to 200 trees per acre, you have a lot of saw timber and not nearly as much pulpwood. So even though they come to about the same total volume based on this data, which is probably the more valuable stand. It's gonna be those lower densities, right? Because at those lower densities, you get saw timber, which may be worth three, four, five times as much, um, depending on the market and your local market conditions, as pulpwood often is. Um, so saw timber is generally our higher value product. And so this is why it's sort of favoring lower densities. So a, a lot of what we're going to go over this semester is focused on planting 400 to 600 trees per acre. And you can kind of see why based on this data. When you add up the pulpwood and the saw timber, that sort of maximizes production. Think about it, the more trees per acre you plant, the more you're spending an establishment. You have to buy more seedlings, you have to spend more money getting those seedlings in the ground. So more trees per acre establishment costs you more money. And then if we go back to our tree per acre data, you know, do, do you want to put out 800, 1,000 trees per acre when, you know, at age 20, 30 years old, you end up with about the same number of trees as if you put out 600 to 400? And again, this isn't even factoring in thinning. Once you factor in thinning, it makes this even more favorable. So. Uh, so th this was an exercise just to get you thinking about how to apply your understanding of stand dynamics. It's okay if you didn't come up with the exact right answers. Um, you, you guys honestly didn't do too bad. We had a group one year where they came up with volume numbers and we actually calculated it. If you made a few reasonable assumptions, their acre was a block of wood 14 feet high and solid. So, <laughs> so it, 
it could be a little less accurate than what you put there, but you're just kind of guessing numbers. So keep in mind, just under 30 tons per log truck, four to six truck loads per acre, that'll help you there. Basal area is getting up to 180, low 200s. At 40 years, at 25 years, you may be up to 150. Lower site index, it's gonna be lower. Higher site index, it's gonna be higher. Poorer silviculture, it's gonna be lower. Better silviculture, it's gonna be higher. So there's a lot of other things influencing the output here. So any, any questions on stand dynamics and how that's gonna play out? Okay, that's all I've got for today.